All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our 13th webinar in the ArcTOS series. Today's topic will cover taxonomy in ArcTOS and will be presented by Mariel Campbell and Teresa Mayfield Meyer, both from the Museum of Southwestern Biology and Phyllis Sharp from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. This next slide contains resources available to you for navigating taxonomy, as well as many other features and functions in ArcTOS, including our webinar recording archive, as well as the ArcTOS handbook. These links will remain available at the top right-hand corner of your screen throughout the presentation. Please also mark your calendars for our next webinar topic on ArcTOS Media, which will take place here in Adobe Connect on Tuesday, January 8, 2019, at 3 p.m. Eastern. And finally, Below are some Adobe Connect tips. We encourage you to type questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, which we'll try to address in real time. And we'll also leave several minutes at the end of the webinar for folks to ask questions. And as always, we ask that you please fill out the one minute I did bio survey following the webinar. I'll be sure to remind you during the Q&A period of this. Um, and we greatly appreciate your feedback. So with that, I will turn things over to Phyllis. Thank you, Emily. Let me get my screen up here. OK. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of how Astro's taxonomy works, um, a little bit about it, and then we'll go into more specifics after that. We like to think of the Arctos taxonomy as a control taxonomy with maximum flexibility. And I'll try to describe that better here. Um, I think one of the things we're always concerned about when we do data entry is that we'll misspell um, one of the uh, names of one of the species. And one of the things that ArcDOS prevents is that with, because the taxonomy is actually a control table. Uh, now that means that that table has to be kept up to date and it has to not have any misspellings in it itself or those small errors could creep back in. So that is one of the things we'll be talking about, how to create taxonomy that's accurate, um, how to edit it, and how to make sure that you've got it structured so that users can find your specimen. But the um, natural history collections can rely on this control set of names. And we do have a validation service. Whenever you add a taxon, it checks a number of web services to see if that is available in them. If none of them show it, it gives you a flag telling you that you might want to double check and make certain that that really is a valid taxon. Now, at the same time, the Arctos uh, taxonomy is very adaptable to changes. If you're an authorized user, you can create, you can edit, and even delete a taxon name if you know it's totally erroneous. And we're going to be showing you how those functions work later on today. One of the benefits is that we have a service through Global Names that allows you to clone a taxonomic classification. Um, whatever is in there comes into Arctos, um, and you don't have to create it yourself. Now, on the other hand, if you have the knowledge to do it, you can create it independently as well. One of the other features, and we will not have time to get into it today, is that whenever there's a major change, such as when a genus moves from one family to another, you don't have to manually go in and change each one of those independently. Instead, we have a hierarchical classification editor. And that one um, enables you to change an entire group in bulk from one place to another. And that way, you assure that you have consistency in what you're doing, which is, of course, one of our, our major concerns. Now, a taxonomic source is always chosen by each collection. And in the past, there have been two, essentially, that we've been using. One of them is Arctos plants, and the other one we call Arctos, which is really everything that isn't a plant. Uh, we are this week adding a third one to that, and it's the World Register of Marine Species. And it's going to function a little bit differently, so I'd like to describe them both. In Arctos and Arctos plants, it's up to the um, individual collection managers who do have taxonomic authority to add and update and essentially keep those databases uh, as clean as can be. With the World Register of Marine Species, we've entered into a partnership with them where we have 
uploaded every one of their taxa, and it's going to be a dynamic uh, situation where every month or so we will re-upload that. And that will enable us to not have to go in and make these major changes independently. It should keep all of the uh, structures very consistent um, and actually take away a lot of the work that is done on the Arctos and Arctos plants taxonomic tables uh, to keep them uh, clean and free of inconsistencies. If we could find more similar uh, web services, such as WORMS, the World Register of Marine Species, we would certainly be pleased to have similar links to them as well. So uh, collections right now can choose from one of these three. But if you wanted to, a collection could also establish an independent uh, taxon source for their collection based on their own expertise or a different web service source. Now, if you're not a natural history collection, we still, uh, the taxonomic model is flexible enough that it can be used for artifacts, for art, for minerals. Um, it's not necessary that you have a binomial uh, system that you're using. Common names are, in many cases, added. And you can search on common names. So those would give some of these other collections the ability to know that users could find their specimens and um, be able to they search for them through various structures, various ways. And we'll show you a little bit more about searching today. The taxonomic classification can populate at many, many levels, all the way from super kingdom down to subspecies. It's not mandatory that you fill these all out. But as we'll show you today, when you don't populate more of those ranks, people may have difficulty finding your specimen. So we'll be showing you a little bit more about that. Now, the taxonomic module, like so many others in Arctos, uh, features a lot of integration between various uh, aspects of our specimens. And I'm going to show you in a minute a sample of a taxon, of a taxon where it has um, the relationship to a linked taxon. In some cases, when you have a synonym, um, it does show the accepted synonym and its relationship to the one that is today the junior or unaccepted synonym. And then it also integrates with everything that has ever been geolocated into a map so that you can see what the distribution of Arctos specimens is. And it also shows any images that you have linked to your specimens. So the taxon record really becomes very valuable to any user looking to learn more about that species. Here's a good example. This is the top of the Amazona Amazonica uh, taxonomic page. It has shown here that four of the specimens in Arctos have been geolocated. And if you clicked on those blue dots, it would take you directly to those specimen records. And then under that, it has images that have also been linked to this species through those specimen records. And through that, you could also link back to this species. So you can see a um, little bit more about what this bird looks like. If we scroll down further, we're going to see that it has two common names. Again, you could uh, search for it on those common names, as well as on the uh, Latin name. It's an orange-winged Amazon or parrot. The next section of, Amaz of Arctos links allows you to find any specimens that have been identified this way, either today currently, or if you look uh, for the include unaccepted IDs, anything that was previously identified with this species and then has been changed since then. So you can alter your search. You could make it an exact match, or you could say, I only want to see specimens that have uh, images of some sort with it. Or again, you could look for Berkeley Mapper and see what the range is on this bird. The classifications that follow below are the ones that contain a classification of this species. And that's going to vary, of course, with what the species is. And then if we scroll a little further down, we see what has been uploaded into Arctos. Um, and this would be all of the data then that would flow into the specimen record. It, in, it includes a little bit about the source on it, that is a valid taxon. And then it gives you the complete classification. In this case, it's quite a complete classification. But if, for example, the family had not been filled out and someone searched for that family, 
they would not find any records of this uh, species. So it's very important, again, that those be completely filled out. We are in the process uh, right now of writing up some new uh, how-to uh, sections for the handbook. Um, we're planning to have how to search for specimens of taxonomy, which we'll be showing you today, how to create taxonomy, how to edit it, an overview of this module with more detail, and then some common problems and how to fix them. We are in the process of so many enhancements that we're not going to try to get those totally uploaded immediately, but I would say that probably early in January we'll have all of those in place and would highly recommend that you take a look at them if you have questions. So our agenda for today, um, this is the overview, and now we're going to move forward with how to search, create, and edit uh, taxa, and then some problems and how to avoid them. So let me stop sharing my screen. And there we go. Hi, everybody. This is Marielle Campbell. Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and uh, we'll start talking a little bit about um, how to search for taxonomy. And hang on just a second. Let me get to a different place here. OK, so um, searching for taxon names can be done from a variety of places in the interface, and I want to sh start by showing you how to search on a name from the specimen search screen, which you can reach from uh, the top of the uh, Arctos uh, Database Museum page and under specimen search. So this is the public interface. And what um, we see here is the, the a simplified view of what you can search on from the public page. I'd like to go to the identification and taxonomy um, search tab here, and I'm going to put in a genus name of a bull. And under the any taxon ID or common name. Now, you should be aware that if you use these basic default search tools for identification and taxonomy or even locality, they are, sometimes can time out because it's searching everything in Arctos in a very broad way. So be aware of that. Also be aware of that even though it says that you may search on a name or an ID or a common name, not everything in Arctos has a common name. So just if you get a timeout or you get a problem using that particular search tool, I'm going to show you in a minute what, what to do. But this is what we got from this particular search, search on the genus Myotis. 37,632 specimens. And we see if we scroll down that these all returning myotes of various species and including myotes spa. I'm going to quickly go down to the bottom of the page just to show everyone that um, the default return of a taxon or, or any list in Arctos is row count 100. So obviously we can't fit 37,000 records on this page, but I'm going to change this for make it a little easier to 5,000. And then we can see more of this chunk of 37,000 records at once. The other thing that you should be aware of is in the left-hand column is the, um, the different collections that have these specimens. Because I'm coming in as a public user, I am seeing specimens that are across all the different collections in Arctos. So this is the global unique identifier for uh, one of the collections. What I'd like to do now is to, to click on, you can click on any of the headers in the search results. I'm going to click on identified as to see what's at the bottom of this list. and see if there's anything different there at the end. Give it a second to search all 37,000 records. And I get some interesting results here. The first record, Alces Alces, is a moose. So this is obviously not a mouse. Um, and down here further, there is a whale. So there's some, something interesting going on with my search results. First off, um, let me click on this moose record and see the actual record. 
and this is a specimen at the University of Alaska Museum. And if I look at it more closely, I see that it's an erroneous citation of myotes, which is why it's pulling up in this very general search. So somebody who did a publication probably did a typo in the, um, in the submission of the manuscript, and they cited the wrong specimen. So that's why we're pulling this up. <laughs> If I go back to my specimen results, I believe the same situation is true for this whale. It's an erroneous citation. I can see these by um, going up here and to Tools, Map, and Customize a Download. I can add or remove data fields, and I can go all the way down to the middle box and click on Verification Status and Refresh, and it should hopefully, when it comes return, give me a little bit more information about the verification status of some of these identifications. And uh, I'll let it think about that for a minute. The other thing that um, can be returned, and in this general type of search using any ID, is you can get synonyms. And these synonyms do not have to be valid. They may be invalid, but if a specimen has been named with something that has a relationship, a synonym of accepted or unaccepted, it will return in the general search results using that first search box. And one of the synonyms of myotes, for example, is the genus Clephrionomys, and that was one of the results that we got when we looked at, uh, when I sorted at the end of this um, group of taxa. So the next thing I want to do is to go to, okay, so that popped up, so you can see that Clephrionomys here is a synonym of um, myotes, and it is also returning in the search results for the genus myotes. So let's go back to, if I go back to mm -hmm. my search page, I have some other options for searching on identification in taxonomy, and all of these boxes have the ability to show more options. So I'm going to click on Show More Options here. Now you can see that there are a lot more things or search parameters that you can include under identification in taxonomy, including the higher classification. And this is something, as Phyllis mentioned earlier, if you search on higher classification, for example, family or phylum, be aware that if a name in Arctos does not have a classification associated with it, you will not find those specimens. Or if, for example, in this case, um, there are some, in the genus Myotes, there are some differences of opinion on what family it belongs to. If you put in Chrysidae or Arvicolidae or Muridae, you would get different results depending on which collections are using that particular classification. So what I would like to do now is to use the second box the identification box. I'm going to put myotes here. And I'm going to say current ID only, meaning I'm going to exclude things that don't specifically have a current accepted ID. I'm also going to say is, as opposed to say start with, or does not contain. So there's some other search options here. And if I search on these parameters, I only get 24 specimens instead of 37,000. And these are explicitly myotes, myotes only. I'm not getting anything with species. I'm not getting anything with fuck. It's a very specific, explicit search. So that may be not what I want either. And I can go back to my search page where I was a minute ago. Or the other thing I can do is to go to show high search terms here and just modify my parameters. Here are my search parameters from the last search. I'm, I want to just change it from here without going back. So I want to change current and prior determinations to include all identifications. And instead of the exact search that I selected a minute ago, I want to go back to start with. And now I'm going to requery. Okay. Now this is a slightly interesting situation because now I have 32,782 results, whereas my earlier result was 37,632. So there's some slight discrepancies between these different searches, and we can talk about why that might be in a minute. Um, but if I search, go scroll down and take a look now at my search results, I see some interesting things. 
one of the reasons that I'm maybe getting more specimens are that in this particular search, I'm getting not only the genus myotes, but other terms that contain the word myotes within them. So here's an invertebrate, not a mouse, that has myotes in it. Now, that probably is a glitch in Arcto's code because I don't think that it should be found under a start switch search. So something we'll probably bring up um, in our issues board after this. But, but it's informative because it tells you that you're getting, this is some of the reason why you might be getting differences depending on the different types of searches that you do. I'm clicking on the sort tab now for identified as to go to the bottom of this file. And notice while we're waiting that by going up here and saying all IDs, I no longer have just the myotes as the genus. I'm getting um, myotes as genus. I'm getting myotes as species, et cetera. But if I go to the, the top of this list here, which was the bottom, I see our friend the moose again showing up and the whale and our Clepreonomy synonyms. I see some other very interesting things, including um, gonomyotes, which again, this is a word that includes myotes, so that's another an insect that's showing up. But I also see this Alticola barashkin, um, which I wonder why, why, that, why is that in this result? And I click on that and look at it, and I see that, well, um, under its identification, Originally, it was identified as Myotes rufocanus in the field. That was subsequently changed to Alticola species and then Alticola barashkin uh, later on. So one comment here is that Arctos allows you to have multiple identifications of a particular individual or particular organism or, or record. And it tracks those identifications. So when we're searching on all names or current ID only, it's because Arctos can keep track of those names. So again, this particular individual has three different identifications. Identifications in Arctos are separate from taxonomy, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So the other thing I wanted to point out was, um, where are we here? In this particular search, um, I'm going to go to one of the synonyms. Clepreonomies gaffi. Again, I'm going to go to the identifications and expand to see all of the identifications. Clepreonomies and myotes are synonyms of each other. And this particular specimen has, had, has been swapped back and forth. This is tracking the changes in the literature. This was a field ID as Clepreonomy in 2003. And then because of changes in the literature, the genus was switched to myotes, then it was switched back again, and it has been subsequently switched yet again to myotes. And so I imagine there will be one more identification on this specimen um, if the University of Alaska decides to accept the new um, reversion back to myotes. But that's a different collection. Regardless, we're able to search on things that have been either identified as in currently or in the past to this name. Now I'm going to go to the actual taxon page for myotes. I'm getting away from the individual specimen record and looking at the taxon name itself. Um, this page, as Teresa will get to in a minute, um, is accessed from as well as from the specimen record, also from search and taxonomy. So I'm in the taxonomy page. So the taxonomy details for myotes rutilus. Here's a map, which is showing me right now fuzzy matches for um, myotes rutilus, meaning it's including some unaccepted IDs not including, to my knowledge, Clepionomies. It's not currently including the synonym. If I click on this link, it will show me the exact matches, but there's a map of the specimens in Arctos. There's some media. If I scroll down further, I see related taxa. So here's where the relationships become really important. Myotes rutilus is an accepted synonym of Clepionomies rutilus, and these are all reciprocal relationships. So here's the reciprocal. Clepionomies rutilus is the junior synonym of Myotes rutilus. Because of this relationship, if I search on myotes and I search on all IDs and in a general search, I get results from both of these. So regardless of what your particular collection chooses to use for the genus name, myotes or clethrionomy, if you create the relationship and you um, do a general search term, you will pick up both of them, even if your particular collection is not using that particular taxonomy. This particular uh, Genus has a, does have a common name, so if I were to search on that, I could find it. And um, I think 
that brings me down to our classification system and I, where Teresa is going to take over and talk about how do we get these names embedded into classifications and how do we create them. So let me change screens and I'll hand it over to Teresa. Okay, so um, probably going to be a little repetitive here, but um, I first want to emphasize that ARCA's taxonomy is not necessarily hierarchical, nor is it limited to biological taxonomy. So in ARCA's taxonomy refers to any formal naming system, um, but for the purposes of this webinar, we're focusing on biological taxonomy. And taxonomy in ARCA's is directed essentially by two tables. The first of which is the taxon name table, and that's the list of names drawn from relevant taxonomic publications. Um, they can be one word terms like animalia, reptilia, or in this case, zizia, um, and they represent higher taxa, or they can be multi word terms such as zizia, aptera, variety, occidentalis. Um, so, Marielle kind of talked about searching from a taxon. Uh, taxon name, and when you do that, um, you usually will get a list of taxa, unless you search on something very specific. Um, <clears throat> each one of these names in the list um, has uh, additional information attached to it in the table um, that are all semi-relationships, so it includes publications that are related to the name, um, related taxa, so the synonyms that Marielle just showed you, um, and um, associated common names. So all of this helps with discoverability, um, and that's what Marielle demonstrated to you. The second table is the taxon terms table. And so when you look at a taxon detail page, and you scroll down a little bit, you get to the classification part, and this is where the taxon terms come into play. So the taxon term includes ranked terms, you can see at the bottom, what you expect from a biological classification, and non-ranked terms here at the top that are intended for clarification and are linked to but not part of the classification. So this includes like the display name, which is auto-generated, the author text, and the nomenclatural code. There's a complete list of all the terms that can be used in both of these tables um, in our code table list. So in order to use uh, a taxon name as any identifier for a specimen in Arctos, it has to be included in the name table. And so the first step to adding a name is to put it into the table. And before you do that, you always want to make absolutely sure that you're working with a name that really needs to be added, that you don't have a misspelling. Um, if you can find a supporting publication for it, that helps a lot. Um, or being able to find the name in a reputable list of taxa, such as worm, that Phyllis described earlier the reptile database, IDIS, or um, some other such database. Once you're certain you have a valid name, um, and by valid, that could also be an accepted name, but um, as Mariel demonstrated before, we can have multiple identifications, and you'd like to keep track of things. So even if something was once identified um, with a name that is no longer valid, that name may need to be an ARCTOS. So once you've determined that, yes, I have this name and I need to add it, um, you also want to make sure that it's not already in Arctos. So I happen to have a name that someone asked me to add. And we are going to see if it's in Arctos. So from the search taxonomy page, you type the name that you want to check, and then 
click search. If the name's already in Arcos, it'll show up in the list below. But we can see here the results. It says zero results. So that means the name is not there. And we are free to go ahead and add that name. And oh, I see that I am not logged in anymore. So um, so this is a, a good demonstration of having authority and ability to add names. Um, you have to be logged in, and you have to be assigned the role to manage taxonomy. So now that I'm logged in, you can see create new name here. And that's what we're going to do. Creating a name is pretty easy. All you have to do is type it in. and create it. Which takes you to um, the Taxon Details page. So this name is now available to be used in identification, but it's pretty incomplete at this point. Um, it's always best to fill in the related terms to increase the chances that anybody searching in Arctos will find your specimen. So the first thing we're going to do here are add those relationships. So these are um, relationships between names and um, items related to names. So the first step is publication. If you happen to have a publication that supports this name in some way or another, you can enter the publication into Arctos, which is a whole webinar in itself. So we're not going to go into how that happens. But if the publication is in Arctos, you can select it here and attach it to the taxon. So I entered this. And I'm going to do this by using the um, short citation. So once you've entered it, you can press tab, and Arctos goes out and searches. And um, it searches our publication data, make sure it's there, and then you can add it. Then we have relationships. If you know there are related taxa, you can go ahead and add the relationships now. If you don't know of any, you can always come back and edit it later to add them. Um, in this case, I was asked to add this name because it, it's a synonym, a senior synonym of another name. So we can add this relationship here. And this name has to be in Arctos already. So if you try to enter a relationship to a name that's not already included in the name table, it, you'll get an error and it won't work for you. Um, so you'll have to basically repeat the process of adding a name that we just did um, in order to create this relationship. And then for the authority, you should enter wherever you got the information from, um, whether it's a paper or um, another source. So in this case, it came from the reptile database. So I will add that as the authority and click Create. And now we've created that relationship. And then finally, there's common names. Um, one great place to find common names is iNaturalist. So um, if people are going to be searching Arctos using common names, it's good for us to have them in there. Because if you don't, somebody will search and find nothing, which is not good. Um, so I looked up a few common names here. And we will add them.
you can add more than one. Some of these um, taxa have a really long list of common names. And you use the save common name changes to add them to the name. So these are all relationships to the name in Arctos. If we return to the taxon detail page now, um, you can see all the information we just added. Here's the related taxon. Here are the common names. Here's the publication. So that's great. We've added a lot of information that's going to help um, in discoverability for anything that's identified with this name. However, we don't have a classification. And um, this is where we have some tools to help make it easier. If you know the classification and you want to enter it manually here, you can just click Create Classification um, and fill in the field from scratch. But we have this nice tool right here at the front, Refresh and Pull Global Names. And what this does is goes out to many different sources and looks for classifications. Yeah, so it looks like I may have spelled the name wrong. Oh, typing is so bad. So when you're first creating a name, um, the great thing is nobody used it yet. So you can do, you can make changes to the name. You can even delete the name. So if you find that you've done something wrong in this process, you can edit it. Once somebody has used that name to identify something, um, you won't be able to make any changes to it. Oh, that's the correct spelling. Well, ah, uh, the dangers of doing things live. <laughs> oh, I know. Huh? Just add it. Oh, I can't do it. Okay. Um, so in the when you use the refresh pull global name, it will go and pull up names that match what you've spelled in um, from other sources, such as worms um, and the reptile database, you can see the list that it goes out to look at here. But since we didn't get anything, we're going to go ahead and add it. I'm not sure why we didn't get anything, um, because we should have. try one more time. I'm losing my internet. Okay, so we will go with the create classification. When you create a classification from scratch, um, you first have to select a source for the classification. Um, the three sources that were mentioned by Phyllis at the beginning, Arctos, Arctos plants, and worms, um, are used usually by specific collections. So the Arctos source is generally used by um, animal collections, while Arctos plants 
is generally used by plant collections. And worms is usually used by invertebrate or marine um, collections that contain marine species. Um, so because what we're putting in here is um, an animal, we're going to add it into the Arcto source. And um, because this came from the reptile database, it came up for you. Interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I had looked this up earlier on the reptile database and in iNaturalist, so we can see it here. Um, in the reptile database, the subspecies are not listed separately, um, but they're listed under the species name. So we can see here that um, the name that I just entered, I guess here I can check the spelling again, is right there. Um, and the classification for this would be the same as the species above, um, but with the addition of the subspecific name. Something real quick here. I'm going to research for that, see if it comes up. Here it is. Okay, we're still not getting anything. Oh, there it is. I don't know what was happening before, honestly. <laughs> um, so yes, when you use the refresh and pull global name, um, you get a list of other sources that contain that name. So here you can see it's listed in the catalog of life. Um, it'll show you some non-hierarchical information and then the taxonomic tree for that name. Um, I always like to scroll through them and get an idea of which one of these classifications seems like it would work best for me. Um, and then once you find the one you like, you can just clone it into this name. So um, you can see that some of these classifications contain a lot more rank um, than others do. This is sort of a preference point for um, different collections, what you like to add and not to add. But um, Depending on the ranks you put in there and how people search, you probably want to have as many as you can. But if you have the major ranks, you're probably going to be fine. So I'll go back up to the top here because I think the catalog of life classification um, looks like a good one to use. It's got all the major higher taxa in it. Um, the species name at the bottom matches the name that we've um, created here, and it has the author name with it, or the author's title, text, I mean. So um, I'm going to clone this classification into the name we've created, which is right here at the top of the page. And the way you do that is by selecting clone classification. The first thing it will do is say, which source do you want to clone this into? So as before, when I was going with the create classification, uh, we have a reptile, it's an animal. And my um, collection that needs this name is using the source of Arctos. So I'm going to clone it into the Arctos source. So I'll click here, create cloned classification. So now we are at the point where we can edit the classification. At the top of the table are the non-classification terms. So these are the terms that 
um, help distinguish this classification from others and just provide a little bit more information. Um, the first one appears here automatically, which is the nomenclatural code. And the things that are entered here help design the display name um, and the scientific name. So in general, for animals, you're going to use um, ICVN, which is the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. Um, for plants, you generally use the ICBN, which is the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. Um, that helps format names and separate taxa. So you can add rows here and add other information. Um, I generally suggest that you add the author text um, and, which in this case was, Um, also, add the source authority. So where did this classification come from? We just took it, we just cloned it from Catalog of Life. The status of the taxon. Is it valid, invalid? Um, this helps anybody who's selecting names to decide, should I pick this name? Or perhaps there's an accepted synonym somewhere um, that I should be using instead. There are a couple of other options here. Um, one of them is the API ID, which is used for worms, and um, the other is a subspecific author text. Um, if there is one, you can add that as well. So once I've added these terms, before I move on, I'm going to save this. And now when we scroll down and look at that table, you can see that information is there. You could continue to edit it, delete it, add more rows if you wanted to. Beneath that, we have the classification terms. And it looks like these cloned um, great from Catalog of Life. Um, the only problem is these terms should be in order um, from the most broad, so the kingdom, to the most narrow, which would be the subspecies. So I need to reorder these um, so that they appear appropriately. And you can use this drag function to put things in the correct order. And you must save it in order for it to stick that way. You can either do that with the save edits at the bottom or the one back at the top. So if we scroll through again, we can see everything that we've done. And it looks pretty good. Then we can return to the taxon page and see, again, all the relationships we added. And the local Arctos classification appears at the top now with all the information that we just cloned in or added. In addition to that, if you keep scrolling, you find all the other um, classifications that had been cloned in. So um, these can help later on, potentially, if you need to edit something. So that's adding a taxon. Now, earlier today, while I was doing some other things, I came across this specimen um, and noticed that the classification under the ID here is not complete missing some parts. And um, if this happens to you and you are able to edit taxa, um, it's pretty easy to do from here. You just click on the name, which takes you 
to the taxonomy details for that name. If you scroll down a little, it looks just like the other page. You can see relationships um, and then the classification. So this one happens to be a plant, so it's in the source of Arctos plant. Um, it looks fairly decent, but you can see in the classification terms down here that it's missing parts. It's missing kingdom, phylum, and class. And in addition, up here in the top, uh, we don't have the author text. So I would like to edit this to make it a little more complete. And in order to do that, we just click Edit Classification. We come back to the same page that we've seen before with adding a classification. But now we can just make changes to things. So this being a plant, the code should be ICBN. Um, and the source authority, so this was originally imported from IDIS, but back in 2007. So potentially at that point, um, the data in IDIS was incomplete, and that's why we have an incomplete classification. Um, so since it came from IDIS, I'd be curious to see if I can find that classification there and um, just use it. I'm going to save this one change that we made. And back to the taxon page. So when we scroll down past the local classification, you find, as before, the others. So there's Catalog of Life, which has a complete classification. We could use that to fill in our gaps. Um, but I'm going to go see if I can find one from IDIS. There it is. And this one's pretty complete. In fact, it's probably more than complete. Um, so what I'd like to do is update the one I have with this information. And there's two ways we could do that. Um, we could just clone this classification, and it would add it to the other classification that's already in Arctos plant. Um, and then from there, we could either pick one or the other, um, or we can mash them together. But I personally prefer to just edit the current classification and use this to help me do that. So we turn to the top here. And I'm going to open the editing um, window in a separate tab so that I can have both of these open and go back to the ITIS classification. So now, editing this classification, I can see Arcus is already telling me, oh, if you're missing a kingdom, please fill this in. I return to the IDIS classification, I can just copy the kingdom, paste it over. And then we had two other um, parts of the classification that were missing. And you do that by adding a row, picking the type of term you want to add, and then adding the term. And with plants, Division and phyla are equal to each other. And just like before, we have these out of order now, so I'm going to drag this up where it belongs.
So adding these higher taxa is going to increase discoverability of anything that's classified with this name. And the thing I mentioned before was that we were missing the author text. which we can also get from this classification right here. So now if we go back to the taxon page, it will look much more complete. And if you go back to um, any specimen with that ID, it'll take about maybe an hour or so for the changes that are made in the taxonomy module to percolate through the rest of ArcDOS. But eventually, um, when I come back to this specimen, the whole classification under the name will be complete right here. Um, and then last of all, I. I'm not really going to demonstrate deleting names and classifications, but it is possible. Um, you can see the delete classification um, option here. And deleting classifications doesn't remove the name. Um, it can still be available for identifications without a classification. It'll just make it less discoverable. Um, and names can only be deleted if they do not have an associated classification and have not been used by any um, specimens as an identification and contain no relationship. So no common names, no publications related, no related taxa. Um, so if you ever find that you have a name that needs to be deleted that you didn't add yourself, um, it's best to confer with the ArcDOS working group before um, just deleting it, just to make sure that you're not um, removing something that somebody either plans to use or has used in the past. So that covers adding, editing, and deleting taxa. And now I guess we'll turn it over for questions, if anybody has questions. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Um, yeah, as Teresa said, uh, we're open for questions, so feel free. I um, just enabled everyone's microphone, so if you want to ask out loud, you can go ahead and do so, um, or you can go ahead and type in the chat box. Just make sure your microphone icon is green at the top of your screen. It looks like Cam might have a question. You can go ahead and speak, Cam, if you have one. Looks like some folks are typing. So one of the questions that came up um, was from Beth about um, kind of adding uh, soil information. And, and um, like Phyllis mentioned at the very get-go, you can uh, create taxon names for any object. It doesn't have to necessarily you know, fit into the Linnaean classification system. And so you really can um, create names for, for any sort of art or uh, artifact uh, that you're needing. All right. Mary Beth asks, at the end of each taxon name, there are instructions. When are those used? Can they be used individually? Can you clarify? Oh, yeah. sources. Oh, the sources. Let me let me share my screen again, and so I can make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So, are you talking about these here? 
Your screen's still loading. Give it a oh, sorry. <laughs> a little bit of a lag. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, as soon as the screen comes up, I, I can't see it here. So. Sorry, I don't know why it's... Uh... Well, you know, like, you went to ITIS. Um, and... You know, it gives you the taxonomic hierarchy. Okay, this screen's fine. So down. Okay. We'll just go down to. Okay. This. this. Yeah. See all these? More like this. When do you use those? The seed hierarchy. I don't see. Oh, this over here. You're talking about this. When yeah. You, when are those used? So this is can be used in in searching. Oh, that was probably a bad move because it's going to find a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to bring up lists that um, are related that use that in their classification somewhere. Okay, so that so then you aren't using you say you were gonna clone a portion of this. Can you do that? That's no, that's not possible. Okay. Yeah, you have to clone the whole thing and then edit either things that you don't want out or add things in that are missing. That's really what I wanted to know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay, and then Nicole asks, what source has been used for taxonomy of paleontological specimens? Um, so I can answer that. Um, I, I had at UTEP um, a bunch of fossils, and we used the Arctos source. Um, but every now and then, there was a plant in there, um, and I just added those taxa. So, just because it says Arctos plants um, doesn't mean that there's only plant taxa in there. And the same goes true for the Arctos source. It doesn't mean that there's only animal taxa. So could you call me back in about 10 minutes? OK, great. All right, thanks. Bye. Yeah, yeah. and Mary Al. Exactly, so that there's other sources as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a second to just once again um, remind you to please, please take the survey. It takes one minute and it really gives us great feedback um, that we incorporate into future webinars. Please do take a moment. We wrap up. Anyone, any last final questions? Thanks, guys, so much. That was really informative. Excellent. I'm not sure if we got everybody's questions. So if you had a question that didn't get answered, um, feel free to email one of us. I think most of the people who ask questions can find our emails. So, um, Or just um, put in. Um, a question through the contact link on Arctos. Great, thanks so much. Oh, it looks like Mary Beth is asking how up to date are the sources? <laughs> They're as, they're as up to date as we make them. <laughs> that really, really varies. Um, uh huh. And some people want to stay up to date, and others want to stay with their legacy uh, taxa. So a lot of it um, sort of depends on who's managing that particular group, you know, or interested in it. So. Um, it, it is highly varied. I will say one of the interesting things we'll learn from using the uh, worms 
is um, if we're all able to keep up with a constantly updated <laughs> set of, ta of taxa, um, because as we all know, there are changes all the time. So, but it, within Arctos, and um, you would know best, Teresa, about Arctos plants, I would say it's extremely inconsistent how well it's been updated. Yeah, it's true because it, it really does depend on um, who's working with the taxa, whether they um, have been updated well or not. And um, both of the sources, Arctos and Arctos plants, were seeded um, a while back. As you can tell, the, that ITIS 2007, um, a whole lot of taxa were brought in at that time. And um, they are not necessarily all complete um, or um, have been updated since that time unless somebody's worked with them. So. Um, it really does just depend on um, if somebody's paying attention to those individual taxa or not. Yeah, and it really does highlight the flexibility of Arctos, at least for identifications, that you know, should your collection or your institution be using an older reference, you, you, know, you can keep those old names. Um, but as long as we make the relationship of the, the synonymy, um, that an outside user can still search on the current name and be a valid synonym um, and still pull up your older name. So, Correct. Great. All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, thank you all again. That was great. Thanks, Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.